Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, comedian Yakov Smirnov talks about using laughter to strengthen relationships. Also tonight, we'll hear about ideas for removing barriers to voting. And we'll take you to a Phoenix store selling local handcrafted products. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio will not be facing contempt of court charges for refusing to hand over 50 hard drives from a secret investigation. U.S. District Judge Susan Bolton agreed with earlier claims by prosecutors that the statute of limitations prevents any charges in the case. Arpaio still faces an April 4th trial on contempt of court charges for continuing with immigration raids after a judge had ordered the raids be stopped. Comedian Yakov Smirnov is putting his experience with laughter to use as a way to repair and reinvigorate relationships. Smirnov recently recorded a special for PBS on the neuroscience of romantic relationships. I believe that you can only improve things that you can measure. Just like a gas gauge in your car, it gives you information of how much gas you have in the tank. Well, laughter can let you know how much happiness you have in a relationship. Laughter is the gauge of happiness. Smirnoff will perform Yakov Smirnoff Professor of Love and Laughter at the Mesa Arts Center tomorrow. We welcome Yakov Smirnoff to Arizona Horizon. Thank you so much Good for having have you me. Here. I'm so excited. Uh, this has been an interesting tour for me. I went on tour from different cities after uh, filming the show and uh, I did Chicago, Boston, uh, San Francisco. This is my last stop on the tour before the end of the year. So it's great to be here. Good. Good to have you. Professor of Love and Laughter. What are we talking about here? Well, I actually teach a course at Missouri State University. I got my master's degree in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania and then I decided I was helping to end the Cold War in the war room in the 80s. Now I wanted to help to end the Cold War in the bedroom. So I shifted my focus and there's a lot more job security there because, <laughs> <laughs> because the war room, you never know right. uh, what's gonna happen there, but you definitely know that there are some challenges that men and women face in the relationships. So that's what I decided to do and Notice that laughter really is a gauge in the beginning of the relationship. Everyone experiences it during the honeymoon stage. Right. Uh, and actually, if there would be no laughter during that honeymoon stage, most people probably would not continue the relationship. And then they get intimate and then they get together, uh, get married, live together. What I noticed that when there's trouble in paradise, laughter is the first thing to go. Second thing, is intimacy. Third thing is your house. <laughs> In that order. <laughs> but I, I'm still trying to figure this out. You're the what a country guy. I mean, you're the guy uh, from behind the Iron Curtain who comes here and talks about what a tremendous country this is because you're not used to all the advantages and opportunities of America. What got you started on this? Well, um, the Cold War ended 1991 and uh, David Letterman had a top 10 list of things that now will change that Soviet Union collapsed. And I made number one on the list, Yakov Smyrna will be out of work. And I thought it was very funny. Six months later, it wasn't. So I started to look for a place where they did not know that the Soviet Union collapsed. And I ended up in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> they, still, they still don't know, and I'm not okay. telling. All right. And it worked out. It was a blessing in disguise in a way because now I have my own 2000 seat theater there and it kind of became like the laboratory of laughter. Unfortunately, I went for a divorce uh, uh, shortly after moving to Branson. Maybe that was one of the reasons. And, um, and I started noticing uh, first my, my own experience that in the beginning there was so much laughter and then slowly it kind of diminished and went away. 
and then there was none towards the end of the relationship. So it became a thought because as a comedian, I use laughter to gauge how is my audience? Are they happy? Are they unhappy? And that's how I, I continue to perform. And in marriage, I didn't think that it was possible to use that same tool. And now I believe it is. So I start asking people, and since then I ask for like over four and a half million people at my theater, uh, how many of you remember laughter being a part of the honeymoon stage? And everybody applauds. And when you ask, has anybody had a honeymoon stage with no laughter? No one. Right. And so I kind of started, this is what God kind of gave me this ability to make people laugh. And in marriage, I couldn't sustain it. So that's what got me on this path. And, but you're studying this. I mean, you got your master's, I think, at Penn, correct? You, you're you're Penn. Your yeah, PhD yeah. now at Pepperdine. Yes. I mean, you, you, this is, this is yeah. quote unquote, serious business for Very you. Very much so. Including the idea of laughter having a specific formula. Uh, very much so, yes, uh, because when you're um, looking at how I create laughter intentionally, like tomorrow I'm at, um, uh, at Mesa uh, uh, Art Center and I'll, I walk on stage and for an hour and a half, I know exactly how I create laughter with the audience. And it's a very specific role. I'm taking a leadership role and I take them on a journey and they follow me and they give me support and feedback, and I monitor it every second. Uh, and I believe that in the beginning of the relationship, that's what strengthens it, is that we keep doing things for each other that make us happy, the other person happy. We focus on that, and that's what I do, and that's what, and then humor triggers the laughter. So I believe that in the beginning of the relationship, focusing on the happiness of the other person is what we later stop doing. But in terms of your formula, yes. it sounds as if there's got to be a creator of the humor and there's, there needs to be an appreciator of the humor, correct? Yes, very much so, very much so. And they could flip-flop. It's right. not constantly one or the other. However, the needs, I use the, the word gift, G-I-F-T, give importance, fun, and time. That's the formula. And it's in my PBS special, and I explain it very clearly there. So what you do in the beginning of the relationship, you give that importance, fun, and time, and then the other person receives it, appreciates it, and laughter is a byproduct of that. Okay, another formula I think you've talked about is someone needs to be in a thinking mode, and someone else needs to be in a feeling mode. If you're both in a thinking mode or you're both in a feeling mode, uh, it, 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 like you, you say, clash. boom. Yeah. You, cla you clash. Well, when two people are thinking, they clash. If two people are feeling, they just kind of hang out and nothing <laughs> happens. Right. Right. So one, one of each is perfect. And you can shift going back and forth, but you have to understand it consciously to be able to sustain it. Interesting. And you, you've studied this, the neuroscience, the study as well. So you're, you're getting into brain chemistry here? Very much so, yes. Because, I mean, there's so much information out there. You know, when, when uh, um, let's say, uh, the woman is sleeping, only 10% of electrical activity in her brain is shut down. Woman sleeping, 90% alert, which is a scary thought. But uh, the, because designed by nature, so in the middle of the night, she can hear the baby crying, that's her role. And, and when a man is sleeping, 70% of electrical activity in his brain is shut down. At that point, man switches to natural gas, which is his role. So, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, but that's yeah. where the humor but, but, comes but, from. That's where the humor comes from. That's right. But this, this is, there it's is- It's real is, stuff. You talk about the idea that women have better peripheral vision. Very much so. As opposed to men, because they're the gatherers, men have better focus this way because, because they're the we're hunters. Because we're hunters, yes. The same thing like uh, uh, the psychologist in Sweden discovered not too long ago, actually, that women have a lot better episodic memory, so they remember what happened, when it happened, and who did it much better than men can do it. So if NFL just hired their first female referee, 
she's going to do a great job. She's going to be throwing flags for the yeah. penalties the team committed years ago, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and no one can you, remember what the penalty was for. <laughs> and he's good. Yeah, yeah, I know. You've been there. Yeah. <laughs> We're all uh, so th this, it sounds fascinating, but when you do counseling and you do workshops yes. and things like this, yes. because men and women are so different, yes. do you have to approach this differently? Very much so. And in my show, like in Macy, you'll see that I normally share the facts, just the facts, and, and then I make humor and make jokes about this. Most of the time, humor is about men. You can't, you can't make jokes, really, because it's interesting the, that if you make jokes about women, men get a very um, protective. Mm -hmm. And women get very protected, so so you really can't win. But if you make jokes about guys, no problem. It's the, yeah, it's it, the honeymooners. It's, you know, the honey. The wives were always in control, I, and the men were always the doofuses. Um, have you been back to the Ukraine? You're from Ukraine, correct? Yes, been yes. Back, I, I back? went back. I was there two months ago. Uh, I go periodically just to kind of see what's happening, and it's it's an interesting scenario, you know, because it was former Soviet Union, yes. and now they don't like Putin because he shoots missiles at them, right? And But but the, the, the humorous part is that the, all that Soviet technology is so outdated that they shoot a missile and then they have to go watch CNN to see where it landed, <laughs> right? Right. But it keeps me, I mean, this whole new um, situation with Trump and Putin is going to be, you know, yeah. it, it, uh, relationships will be interesting to watch them because what was happening is initially when I started um, discovering this, Reagan and Gorbachev, they were laughing together. And that was a great thing because they were able to find that pattern of thinker, feeler, uh, performer, audience, whatever it is, and it was working. Isn't that something? It's very, it's, it's totally it, universal. Yeah. And then you could see their laughter was kind of a gauge. But when the laughter goes away, and Putin and Obama were not laughing at no, all, no. so that wasn't happening. So we'll see what's going to happen with uh, Trump and Putin. Well, it's good to have here. Before, I got to ask a question. How often do people come up to you and say, what a country? Fairly often. Fairly, <laughs> yes, fairly often. Does it but ever get old? What? No, no. You know what? I've been so lucky and uh, to, to be on a kind of have some contribution, and people use that, that phrase, and I believe that that phrase is legit, and, and I, I had a conversation with your next guest backstage, and we were talking about voting, and I'm like, you know, 54, 55% people went to vote, and I'm going in Russia, voting was mandatory when I grew up in the Soviet Union. And so 100% turnout, but only one person yes. on the ballot. Yes. Right. Right. So and so to me, when you have choices, I think you need to go and vote. It's just. Well, we, we like to think that as well around here. It's good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Congratulations Thanks for having on me. a very interesting Appreciate career it. and good luck in the future. Yeah, please stop by and see the show tomorrow. You'll laugh here, Yakov. As <laughs> All right, there he goes. <laughs> Yakov, good to have you here. Thanks Thank for joining. Thank you. Me. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. 
The League of Women Voters of Arizona, in cooperation with ASU, is holding a Voters' Rights Summit on January 7th. The event will focus on removing barriers at the ballot box. Here to discuss the summit and the protection of voters' rights is League of Women Voters board member Rivko Knox and... Carol Mattoon, chair of the League's Summit Planning Committee. Good to have you both here. Thanks Thank for you, joining us. This, this summit, a uh, uh, voting rights summit, what are we talking about? Well, we have seen in the last few years a number of moves both across the country and here in Arizona to curtail voters' rights in all kinds of ways. Um, both nationwide, we know that there was something called Section 5 of the Voters' uh, Right Act, and that's been overturned. So uh, states can now, including Arizona, can make all kinds of changes in their voting procedures, many of which have negative effects and curtail voters' ability to vote, to register and to vote. So the summit is designed to remove barriers to the ballot box. What are some of those barriers? Well, some of those barriers, and, and I, what I would like to say is the summit is really to pull a, a variety of people together. And we're going to have 10 speakers that are going to be talking on a variety of issues. We thought perhaps in the beginning that we would just take one issue and really look at it deeply. But there's so many facets to this that we thought it would be better to help educate people on the different areas that we're looking at. And so we're going to have 10 speakers that are experts come in. And then we're also going to have breakout groups. So it's not just for people to come and, and hear other people speak. But because we're trying to invo uh, invite uh, educators and legislators and all groups that are interested in this kind of stuff coming together that have a lot of different experiences and look at the issue differently mm -hmm. so that we can see we have people who are running elections and we have people that are working wanting to uh, vote and so we're looking at different aspects of that and we want the discussion to go on so that as we see some of these barriers which we can list we have different inputs, and so we can come together, look at the long-term way of how can we make it more uh, easily accessible, efficient, and it's open to everybody. We don't want to leave any voter or any votes behind. And again, uh, as far as these barriers are concerned, some people are saying, I, I don't understand what, what, what barriers are out there. Well, there's all kinds of barriers. I mean, that, uh, for example, um, people have to have the correct ID to vote. And by the way, the League of Women Voters does not support voter ID. Um, because there have been no instant, no significant instances of voter fraud. Uh, there are barriers you have to register, for example, 30 days before. And unlike someone like me who's interested in public policy constantly, a lot of people don't really pay attention until very close to the election and they cannot vote. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, uh, for example, in the uh, presidential preferential primary, there were not enough voting places. So there were very, very long lines. And when people stood in line, especially if they had disabilities, there was nowhere to sit. Right. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, we also have situations in which uh, the voting places are not easily accessible to people who don't have cars. So there's a number of different barriers. And yet, if you, I know with the summit you're supposed to have a lot of people from a lot of different angles. Will you have people from the angle that says, we need voter ID? There may not be much in the way of fraud, but the reason is because we are so vigilant and we don't want that fraud to creep in. Are you going to get those folks speaking as well? Well, we're going to have a variety of speakers. So we have the Secretary of State's office. We have the federal compliance officer there. We have a political science professor. We have an election law attorney. So the, because the league is nonpartisan, we do want this to be an open conversation where everybody feels welcome to put their point of view. But I would think the definition of a barrier in place would be the first step because some people don't see those as barriers. Well, and you know, we're very open to hearing that as well. We have invited all the state legislators. We are encouraging and trying to get a lot of other elected officials to come. And so we'd like to hear different perspectives. Uh, as far as voting formats, alternatives maybe to the current voting format, mm -hmm. what's out there? What, what can well, be discussed? Well, there are, for example, there's something called ranked choice voting, where you're talking about different voting formats, where right now you vote for one person, and then in the primary, and then there's a general election. Mm -hmm. In a uh, ranked choice voting, you have four or five names on the ballot, and you identify who's your top choice and your second, third, fourth, etc. There's only one election, and 
candidates have to appeal to a broader range of people because even though they may know they wouldn't be the voter's first choice, they might wind up being the second. So there's examples like that as, as a different alternative to voting. Obviously, there's same-day registration and voting, which is a different approach. Uh, Arizona is pretty good about doing online voting, uh, where you can, I'm sorry, register online. Uh, some states are going to all online voting. As far, are, are there mechanisms in place to facilitate these kinds of changes? These kind of changes are actually taking place in colleges. They're taking place in other countries. So it's not like we're inventing the wheel. Right. So yes, there's mechanisms. There's groups that are working nationally as well as locally on these issues. So it's, it's the will to make it happen. As far as the forum itself, what do you want folks to take from this event? Well, so often you'll have an event and people come and they hear these great lectures and then they go away and they're enthused, but nothing happens. Right. So what we're hoping is because we're networking with one another, working, brainstorming things that we might do that we want to do, we might have some short-term goals, some long-term goals. And so we're hoping out of this uh, summit will come uh, a working group that'll work on some of these things. And because you have legislators and you have these variety of people, then the solutions, you've already got some of the people buying in to it. They're the ones that are gonna help make it happen. And so we do hope that this is just not gonna be a one day event, but out of this, we're gonna have, there's gonna, at the end of this, we're gonna come together after our small group discussions. Right. Pick, okay, a couple things that we wanna do. And then we're hoping that people will sign up and say, okay, I wanna work on this on a long-term basis. We don't want it just to be a one-day ba basis. Okay, so when, where is the event, who's invited? Give us the particulars. Uh, it's gonna take place on January 7th, Saturday, at ASU New College West, which is at 4701 West Thunderbird Road. Uh, it will start at nine o'clock in the morning and end at four. Uh, you can go online to uh, www.lwv, which is shorthand for League of Women Voters, az.org, uh, and you can easily register online th right there and then. All right. Very good information. Good to have you both here. Thank, Thank you so you much so for joining much. us. We appreciate it. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. Phoenix is a great place to shop locally. That's according to Yelp, the consumer-driven review-based site which ranks Phoenix in the top 15 cities for shopping local. Economic experts say that when you shop locally, four times as much of your purchase stays in your community as opposed to when you shop at big box stores. Producer Shauna Fisher checked out Francis, a neighborhood store that showcases Arizona products. George Ann Bryant is a curator of crafts. Yes. Francis is an eclectic mix of all the things I love. <laughs> from jewelry to clothing to items made in Arizona. I love featuring local artists. I feel like the customer really connects with that. They actually now, they'll say, they'll come in and ask specifically for what is made locally. We're just mixing up. Samantha Thompson and Andrew King are the owners of Standard Wax, a candle company based in Phoenix. We make candles that are made to be repurposed after the candle's gone, so all of our candles are housed in ceramic vessels that you can use as planters, pencil holders, spare change collectors on your dresser, whatever you want to do with them after the candle burns down. Trade secret. Francis was one of the first stores that bought the candles wholesale, and several years later, they're still a bestseller. It's so cute. Most people coming to Francis are looking for a gift item, something unique. They will always find something new when they come in. We're constantly bringing new merchandise in every week. But it's the locally made products that hold a special place in George Ann's heart. Western Spice. Yes. And in the store. Hi there, how are you? She has set aside several tables just for items crafted here in Arizona. Definitely, I love uh, the Arizona items right now. A lot of local people are doing like local graphics and uh, handmade wooden items. Samantha says George Ann's dedication to local products and artists is valuable, especially to startups who face a roller coaster of challenges getting off the ground and are looking for support. Challenges are never ending, it seems. We like to tell the story of the first candle we ever made, and it literally smelled like cat urine. 
Um, so it's not like we woke up one day and decided we're going to make candles and it's going to be amazing. George Ann says she loves working with new artists for just that reason their perseverance. And she needed some of that herself when she opened Francis. George Ann came up with the idea for a neighborhood store in 2006. Well, I really felt like there was a need for shopping in Central Phoenix. I really loved Central Phoenix, but you really had to go to the Biltmore or Scottsdale for shopping. So I really wanted to open it in a neighborhood. And that neighborhood came through in a big way when George Ann needed them most, she says. In 2008, the economy took a dip and the customers were just so vital to stopping in and getting all their gifts here. They were always asking, are you guys doing okay? And they just really made a point to start shopping local. George Ann says when you buy local, you're doing so much more than just supporting a business. You're building up your community. So much more of the money that they spend in the local store stays within the community. And they're also giving jobs to local people. So to keep a community going, we need to have those stores. We need to have the restaurants, everybody working together. and. The local synergy just really helps. Francis is located on the corner of First Avenue and McDowell. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, State Superintendent of Public Instruction Diane Douglas joins us to talk about AZ Kids Can't Wait, her plan to improve the state schools. Diane Douglas on the next Arizona Horizon. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.